It's so like the thing they put in your mouth at the dentist and close. <laughs> These huge needles huge. you stick into like the arterial veins or the arterial veins. That is not what I meant to say. Well over 100 miles an hour if needed. On the back end, they, they normally have <laughs> Run a... Run away, hurts. You would need that, but in the state. my wife has a crush on you, so stay Stop far right away. Now. I'm sorry. Welcome back, everybody. Dynamite intro. Mrs. Lush. Guys, if you've been around with us for a while, you know we have an ongoing multi-year saga of our infatuation with Victor Sweeney. So he was on Wired and became an overnight internet superstar, and we've watched a few of the variations of his videos answering questions on Twitter about dead bodies. Victor Sweeney is a mortician, by the way. He likes to, he loves dead bodies. I don't know that he loves them, In a but scientific he cares for way, them. yes, he cares for them in a very <laughs> respectful way. He's well kept, well put together, well spoken, fun to watch. So this video is one of his more recent ones through Wired, who he collaborates with. It's a few months old now, but we haven't watched it yet. We did, I did get your emails about it. We're gonna crank through it right now and get back on that Victor Sweeney train and so, try to keep my wife settled down because she's calm a, bit down of, now. a bit of a fan. I am a fan. But I gotta say though, like the fact that he's not an internet personality, like his, at his core he is a mortician, he takes care of bodies, but he just has such a nice presence online. He does, yep. Hi, I'm Victor M. Hi. Sweeney, licensed mortician. We're here at Corismo Funeral turn those off. Come on in. Uh, so this one is him showing every step a body goes through at a funeral. Okay. Oh, snap. Okay, I was going to say, there's no way they're obviously not using a real body. So. I wish they would, honestly. I know you do, you f***ing weirdo. Access to the whole funeral home. We're going to go into the prep room where we embalm and prepare bodies. Normally, uh, if a person from the outside like yourself wanted to go into the prep room, they wouldn't be allowed. We've been given special access today from the Department of Health. And we're going to look okay. at caskets, urns, that kind of stuff. We're gonna get to see the funeral chapel, and then we'll also get to take a tour of the hearse, see how that works. With us today is Sean. Victor. It's interesting because it's such a morbid topic. But it's also so interesting. Well, that's what I mean. It's so interesting as a third party. People that go through this experience is because they're preparing to say goodbye to a loved one. So it's like, you're never able to appreciate maybe the interesting nature of it because you're going through the grief. Yeah, it's true, but they're also probably not thinking about these components of it. They're sitting down with someone that works at the not. funeral home director and they're making plans for an event, a ceremony, how they want the body to be taken care of, embalmed or cremated, whatever the process might be, but they're not getting into what that looks like. No, of course. Yeah, that's why getting to see the nuts and bolts behind it is, I'm into it. Sure. Thanks for having me here. I really Thanks appreciate it. Death can be kind of scary. There's a lot of things about our, our field that are unknown. I'm yep. excited for you to bring those answers to everyone today. First, we're going to go inside the prep room. <laughs> why don't you come with me and I'll show you what we do. Looks like the guy from the, uh, oh God, what's that movie? Never mind. I know nothing. So here we are in the prep room, the room where we do all the embalming. Embalming is meant to sanitize and preserve bodies as well as provide some level of restoration. So for instance, if someone is grievously injured, we can kind of work to reconstruct them. Mm. Um, in addition to making sure that their body holds up for maybe the week that we have in between the time when they die and the time when we have the funeral. In this funeral home, the prep room is off of the garage. I don't want to be uh, bringing cots with bodies on them up or down stairs or through the whole funeral home to get them here, because then we can go right from the van to the room where the magic happens. Oh, in previous episodes, he did show some of the embalming tools. Yeah. And I believe that you're essentially like recirculating this through their circulatory, through the bloodstream. Through the bloodstream I because think. the yeah, I, to to give them color, to do I think, to, and obviously to preserve. I guess he'll tell us, but that's like some of the stuff he showed us, where like these huge needles huge. you stick into like the arterial veins or the arterial veins. That is not what I meant to say. The uh, <clears throat> atri atrial fibril <laughs> fibrillations. Yeah, I'm a scientist. We've sure. taken Mike. a dummy mic from the back of the van, and now we are ready for the embalming. Every time you prepare a body, you kind of start from zero. So you're going to do inventory, you're gonna look them over, you're gonna make sure that you know everything about their condition, and then adjust your embalming processes accordingly. 
In a normal situation, I'm covered from head to toe with personal protective equipment, and that's mainly to yes. keep me safe when I'm dealing mm -hmm. with blood and pathogens. I'm also dealing with embalming fluids. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are things that keep are. bodies preserved and sanitized, and a lot of these contain aldehydes. These are actually toxic chemicals. Every yes. prep room is going to have ventilation. It's going to have formaldehyde level monitoring. All these things are in place to keep me safe and uh, to make sure that we don't infect our public spaces with what we have to do here in private. One of the first yeah, steps yeah, that was the of tools embalming we saw is before. setting the features. So making the face into a, a natural expression. These are called eye caps. Sometimes when people die, their eyes are open and we can position the eyelids. And this part is the maybe the the strangest for me. Yeah, from it is a, creepy. From the perspective of if I was to do, had to do it, create a facial expression on a, mm. a dead person. But again, you're doing it for the sake of family. So you're doing a good thing, I suppose. Have them stay that way. We use this device called the needle injector that mm. actually punches these sharp brads into the upper and lower jaw, kind of keep it in place. They'll mm. stay that way. Brads, is that like a... Pit, like the next part of embalming after we set those features is we're going to do what's called arterial embalming. So we're going to gain access yes. to the arteries, and then that's how we're going to use our embalming machine to pump. That's what I was trying to say earlier. You got it. Art, what did I, I said? You like, said like venous arteries or something like, like that. Vein arteries, yeah. Arterial embalming. It's one or embalming. the other. Yes, arterial embalming, yeah. So there are three different kinds of fluids that embalmers use when preparing a body. The first the arterial solutions are going to be fixatives. So they're going to sanitize the body, they're going to preserve it, and they're going to fix it into place. Mm. Other fluids are what we call co-injection or accessory fluids. Co-injections might add fluid to tissue. They might draw fluid out. They'll add color. Sometimes maybe a rosiness is helpful. Sure. And then we have other fluids that uh, are yeah. really good at preventing certain types of decomposition. Yeah. Probably the most common place for a funeral director to gain access to an artery is right up here in the neck, and that is called the uh, carotid yeah, yeah. artery. Let's say you choose not to raise the carotid artery. You can actually embalm a whole body right here from the leg. Vene, yeah. So the femoral yeah. artery is one of the largest arteries that we have access to. If you push fluid up, you can open the corresponding vein, and then the blood will drain out. And arteries are interesting because they're very rubbery. Think like a- How do you know like which one's the artery, which one's the vein? You just do. You just do. <laughs> Anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. Because that the the definition artery vein one is blood Arteries. flowing away from the oh, heart right. and the other is bringing the blood back veins veins back to the heart yes, right yes yes so it's just one huge massive loop. artery away artery away that's a right a. yeah yeah so you just stick it into one cut the other and you're just pushing it all out while you're bringing it all in it's going through the whole I mean I don't know I only to ever took care of people that were alive for the most part oh this is it's quite different yeah but that's like but when accessing you, when you, the artery or vein would be the same like when you hook someone up one. though for example like when i watched an open heart surgery they hook them up to is it called the transfusion machine no it's bypass a, uh yeah it was a bypass they hook you up to a machine that circulates your blood while they're operating on the heart bypass a, it's a bypass yeah and that's essentially the same thing it must have an entry and an exit point and it's circulating the blood basically replacing your heart temporarily moving the blood through your body while they're doing the surgery on your heart while the heart's not. That's so crazy to me. And like when they're doing bypass surgery, the heart stops, right? Can you slice? Well, you could technically, but like- do they, do, Well, I guess the question I have is, do they purposely shock the heart to stop it so they can work on it? I think it depends a lot on the conditions, like what's going on. Yeah, I suppose. I'm trying to remember, but when I watch the bypass, like they, they have a machine that's doing what your heart's does, supposed yeah, to. Yeah, it does the circulation. So then they like basically stop your heart, do what they need to do, and then restart it. And then it's just unbelievable. I It's so beyond the comprehension. Like restart the fact it and hope it works. Yeah, yeah. Tube rubber band. And so when we put high pressure into them with the embalming machine, yeah. they're able to withstand that. The fluid just goes right into the body. So this tank here is the embalming machine, and this tube goes right down the artery and then is gonna shoot fluid in at a high pressure in order to circulate that fluid through while pushing out the blood that's been pooling in the venous system. That is nutty. Yeah. So this will actually simulate something of a heartbeat. So if you have large clots that are stuck in a venous system, yeah. you can pulse the fluid through at a high pressure and push those clots out of the body, and that'll create better distribution for our fluid and 
better preservation in the final procedure. Because hmm. imagine the blood it starts clotting a lot. immediately. Yeah. It starts clotting after you die, obviously. I'm, I'm guessing, yes. Yeah. Yes. Warning, gross this stuff ahead. My Jesus. wife's Oh, you, you're probably like worried. And you well, need it's, to... it's a, a dummy, so I'm okay. But this type of stuff on actual people makes me queasy. Get into, let's say, the, the meat of their leg to gain access to their artery. This guy, you can put in. Opens it up. Like this. Yeah. And it spreads out all that fat. Any number of handy scissors. A curve is nice sometimes, especially as you're uh, cutting through arteries or maybe other uh, tissue. This is called an aneurysm hook because it's used for separating tissue and hooking the arteries and pulling them out Shut where you up. have access to them. This is called a groove director. Ooh. I can hold this, put it into the artery, and then this hard surface in the bottom is gonna open up the artery so I can slide my other tools right in. An okay. angular forceps, this you can actually use to pull out clots. This Oof. guy is called a drain tube. Typically, this end here is going to be hooked up to another tube that we run down the table, and then this end, is going to go inside the artery. One thing that's I feel great like I about remember that one is that yep. we can actually control yep. how much blood leaves the body. If we're having drainage issues, you can stop it. Pressure is building in the body, and then all of a sudden, you'll pull the, the end, and whoop, whoop. it'll come pouring out the bottom. So you want to create yes. that pressure because sometimes you need a little extra to get into the extremities, like into the toes or the fingers, something like right. that. I'm curious too, in thinking about that, when there's clots, is there ever a scenario where it's something that can't be pushed and it like ruptures? You said you uh, just go in and have to get it. You have to physically get it, like, okay. Different kind of forceps or whatever they have to. So you maybe you can see based on the coloration of the body, like where it's stopping, and you have to like go in there and figure out where. But then what happens, like, what if it like bursts a vein and then it's just like flowing into the. I don't know, dude. There must be some crazy scenarios there. Cavity embalming is the second part of preparing a body in which we want to puncture all the hollow organs and mm. then drain out all the goo and nastiness that wants to live in there. So oh. the tool that we're going to use to do that is called that the chokar. That is so interesting. The is You're just puncturing all of the organs? Okay, I feel like maybe that's steel. what I remember. Tip <laughs> he definitely showed us the that. Organ, and then this part is actually... So I like the thing they put in your mouth at the dentist and close. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a Except large it's blood from that. your hollow organs. Yeah. Hooked up to a vacuum. So it's going to yeah, suck yeah. all that goo right yeah, down yeah, the yeah, drain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same goop. sound effect. We'll actually, suck the goop. Uh, provide access points for introducing what we call cavity fluid. So embalming fluid that's made to uh, kill all the bacteria and solidify those hollow organs so we don't have any issues down the road. This is a trocar as well. It's slightly different in that. It Trocar. doesn't suck fluid out, but puts Probably a fluid barbarian in. name. So in this case, we feel like Trocar is a good name for a barbarian in World of Warcraft. Oh. Trocar. <laughs> Swear, sorry, my my brain's on a different wavelength than yours sometimes. Take a bottle of cavity <laughs> fluid. I'm genuinely we interested in this. I know. I'm thinking about the Warcraft. Trocar, and then right through that same hole we made before, we go back in. All the while, gravity is actually mm. drawing the fluid down and inserting that from the end of the tip back into all the holes we made, into the mm. heart, into the lungs. And then you'll go around, back down into the abdomen. This is really, the lower part is where all the bacteria like to hang out. Oof. And that, my friends, is how you embalm a body. When I embalm my first body, it, it is kind of scary, kind of unnerving, because it's I one bet. of those things you have to do right the first time, yep. mm. and you only get one chance. So if you screw yep. up and maybe pressure is too high and the face starts to swell and you don't see that, you've caused a problem with grandma or grandpa that you can't really fix. So mm. attention to detail is everything. Wow. It's just so interesting to me, because I would think, you know, I'm sure there are things that are harder or impossible to fix once you screw up 100%. embalming a body. But coming from the nursing world, I'm like, your patients are dead. Like, you're not going to hurt them physically, obviously. Okay. Like, you're using it's, all these kinds of tools and stuff like that. It's a different type of pressure, yes. Like, when, yeah. the, when somebody's actual life or death is on the line, that's obviously, I would consider that a higher pressure situation than making sure a dead body looks presentable for a wake, right? Right. <laughs> or even just, like, maintaining someone's comfort level, like, while you're doing a procedure. Right, right. It's an interesting art form I feel it like, definitely but it's it's an art and a science very it is. much it is it's a combination of the two and this guy clearly takes a lot of pride in his job just from all the videos we've watched of him he's super knowledgeable and there's been questions in the previous videos people ask him like how do you do you have to disassociate like how do you deal with doing that and right. he 
explained it really well. I forget he what did. he said. He did. He gave but... a nice answer. And it wasn't that you disassociate. You, I don't know. I'm not going to answer for uh, him. Yeah, I don't remember either. But like, it's obviously it's not something you would be able to do on someone you cared about or knew personally. You would have someone else do that. You know, I, I would think. If you have a loved one that passes away, odds are good you'll end up in a room just like this to select your funeral merchandise. Right. Yeah, you don't need to do all the embalming for the cremation family might want to select an urn and these range all over the place there are simple urns that maybe start at a hundred dollars or less they're really fancy maybe uh, cast bronze ones that are hundreds and hundreds of dollars or some families just opt to use the container that comes from the crematory just a simple Shoebox. plastic urn any one of those is perfectly suitable for what a family wants to do if you're going so to spread the ashes, no need for a fancy urn. Sure. And is often used interchangeably is the difference between a casket and a coffin. In other parts of the world, uh, like in the UK, for instance, they have what are called coffins. So these are what we might call uh, anthropoid shaped. So they're narrow at the top where the head is. Dracula they widen style out of the ones. Shoulders, then they yeah. come back in again towards the feet. Whereas caskets are uniformly rectangular. In the United States, we used almost exclusively caskets. Caskets vary as widely as you can yeah. possibly imagine. We have mm. very simple cardboard cloth covered caskets that might be more suitable for a, a simple burial or maybe cremation. And then we have high end caskets made from uh, hardwoods like mahogany or cherry or even bronze caskets. Variety is, is really the, the spice of death here. <laughs> wow, he did that. He went there. Few, yeah, yeah, funerals are interesting because it is like everything, it's a it's an industry, it's a business that's necessary, but it's an also an industry that needs to make a profit. So Absolutely. you have like your different tiers of services, your different tiers of caskets, you can have profit margin on. I can only imagine what like being on the business end of a funeral service looks like. Like how do you try and increase your bottom line or get more client I, I don't know Here's I mean you're not going to be trying to get more clients well I was I just going to say there will it's never, more like beating out the competition that's, that's right there'll never be a shortage of necessity for your services uh, as long as these traditions remain which I imagine they will for a very long time it is probably comes down to word of mouth and how well you care and the families feel like they were treated having in their Absolutely. experience and, and you know they have to be willing to work with people in their budgets because this even like a baseline, I'm sure, yeah. is still quite costly. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Certain some, you know, there's not a lot of families are in a fortunate enough position to be like, oh yeah, just take the nice coffee yeah, and all this stuff. Yeah, just drop the ten grand it's, for that one. That's what I mean. Like, how you're not planning, you know. Funerals typically, oftentimes, aren't one of those things you have a little rainy day fund for, you know? I don't, you know, for me, I've never thought about it for myself, personally, but I don't hate the idea of, like, the, the cremation and the ashes spreading. I believe we did that with my grandfather. I'm not sure, but and that was by, by his wishes. That's, that's what he wanted, but everyone's got their own thing. Let me know when you decide. Here we are in the <laughs> funeral chapel. We've taken our dummy Mike, and now we are ready for his family to come and, and say their final goodbyes. This opening here is called a cap, and this is an example of what we call a half couch casket. So you're only going to see uh, from about the midsection up. You should note every Pretty person normal. in the casket is wearing pants, but not always shoes. Good to know. When we go to close a casket, um, oftentimes I have the deceased family around me. There's a locking mechanism under here and we're just going to simply pull that up. We'll open the latches here at the bottom. And then with the family, we'd all grab hold. We slowly lower the lid. And then we say goodbye. As a last step, um, I'll have you come with me as we load the casket into the hearse and we'll make our way to the cemetery. Come on. I wonder how this, you know, niche internet stardom has affected this dude's business i gotta know yeah i mean oh, this is such a cool one. it's such a localized oh, thing though 100 percent. yeah you have a great hearse sean and does he own his own company or is he like working for another i feel like he's he said the, he's the funeral director i think could be a family business maybe I think he said I feel like so many funeral homes are family like just family businesses that have been in the family for multiple generations but yeah 
So the vehicle behind me, some call it a hearse, some call it a coach, but in any case, it gets coach. the deceased from point A to point B. There are some special things about a hearse. The first thing you should know is that every single one is custom built. So there's not a single company that makes hearses right off the line. Every one is made with a normal car, cut in half, extended, wow. and totally rebuilt. You do not need a wow. special license or anything to drive a hearse. Being built on Lincolns and Cadillacs, usually they have nice big engines and they go well over 100 miles an hour if needed. On the back end, they, they normally have <laughs> Run a away hearse. You would need that, that, but in the states, that swooshy design on the back is called a Landau bar. It's kind of the uh, the quintessential mark of a hearse. It's a remnant from when they used to be coaches, so horse-drawn carriages, and the top would pull back. Today, we don't have convertible hearses, but it's a nice mark when you see one. You know exactly what it is. So one thing you'll notice about a hearse is that the door opens really wide. So when you have six casket bearers, you can get nice and close before you put the casket on the rollers. And the rollers go all the way inside, so it's a nice, smooth uh, roll into the hearse. When you get the casket in place, the brakes, you're gonna take this stopper, Put it just like this okay. and keep the casket so it doesn't go flying out of the back. Ah. I wonder how much a casket weighs. When I load a hearse, Sevy. I always go head first. Uh, the reason being, when you tilt the casket a little bit to get it in, then their feet are down. And if they slide, they slide towards their feet. Whereas if you flipped it around the other way, they'd be going head first mm. and it's awfully heavy. So always the heavy head end first and uh, the feet will follow. Well, why don't we try loading it yeah, up with our, with our friend Mike. We've for sure. taken him from point A. Now let's go to point Z. And uh, Sean is going to help me here. Just two guys taking one cast? That's probably... Oh, it was from... Uh, yeah, mm. they had a roller. The music. I know. I feel like I'm out of service. So wild. I so appreciate you coming with me on this trip today through oh, the funeral Oh, thank you, home. Victor. I hope you've learned some things and that maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable as you come with me on my life with the dead. <laughs> <laughs> He's like trying to crack a joke the at the end. The way he said that, the cheeky smile. Mm. Oh, man, another installment of the Victor Sweeney saga. I'm not gonna lie. Life. I could never get sick of this. I watching Victor it's Sweeney. It's just interesting. That one was interesting because that you know all the ones we've watched previously were him sitting at a computer like answering questions. Mm. That one was a little more involved. I would say you know a lot of that stuff you kind of know but you never really see behind the curtain. So that was interesting. Yeah. And all the bike stuff, but I will say, Victor, if you're out there, thank you for your service and for your lovely YouTube videos. <laughs> My wife has a crush on you, so stay Stop far it right away. Now. Oh, I'm sorry, I know. We we meme that in the first one. Actually, the thumbnail from the first video is literally a picture of you and him and a big heart. Oh my god. <laughs> I like, you know I didn't even know. I that. know from like four years ago or something. No, we just think you're very interesting and we like watching your videos. And thank you guys for watching us watch Victor Sweeney. I know there are some of you in the audience that ha have been here since the first Victor Sweeney video. So we thought we'd keep it going because we love doing the stuff. Uh we appreciate your time as always, and we can't wait to see you in the next video. Peace out.